Arbery, as you know, was chased, shot, and killed while jogging through his Georgia neighborhood back in February. And the man whose home that Arbery entered shortly before he was killed says nothing was stolen from the home, which was under construction at the time. Let's talk about facts. A couple of months ago, a man named Ahmed Arbery was shot and killed. And if you follow only progressive sources, they would tell you that two white men hunted him down and killed him in cold blood. And I will tell you 100% that is fake news. Why? Because I've seen the video that's circulating. While I'm not saying there's, you know, one side is innocent, one side is guilty, I'm telling you the narrative being pushed by many on the left is just fake news. It is sensationalized, it is framing, and we have ourselves a complicated story. McMichael and Travis then get in a truck, they start pursuing Arbery, they try to cut him off, but according to McMichael, Arbery turns around and then begins running in the opposite direction. Meanwhile, McMichael says that he shouts, stop, stop, we want to talk to you, but Arbery keeps running. They shout again, this time Travis gets out of the truck with his shotgun. At that point, McMichael says that Arbery begins, quote, violently attacking Travis. Arbery and Travis then reportedly start fighting over the shotgun. Travis then fires a shot. A second later, he fires another shot. Arbery then falls down face first with his hand under his body. Michael then says he rolls Arbery over to see if he had a weapon, but Notably here, and this is one of the key points of this story, Arbery was unarmed. Because people have jumped to conclusions and picked a side before any of this stuff came out, and now many people are gonna walk around with an egg on their face when I told people very vividly and clearly to wait before you pick a side. You don't need to be pro McMichael, you don't need to be pro Arbery. You need to be pro facts. The number of people I've seen using the video of Arbery looking through a house on construction and using that as a justification for him being shot and killed, that's disgusting, it's ridiculous, and it saddens me. But hell, as a much younger man with nothing else better to do, I've walked construction sites before. And of course, as always with these things, understand, I, I say this while open to more information, open to more evidence, open to a further investigation. A lot of people are rejecting it, but it's evidence, it's video, it's gonna be in a court testimony at some point. And I want people that are watching this to do your research. Look it up. So I did some research. Let me start off by saying that no idea should be exempt from scrutiny. If we are going to act on ideas, we better do our best to make sure that they are true. Let me repeat what every sincere educator has been trying to get through to us. We should not be getting all of our information from one type of source. The American education system has done many of their students a disservice by spending a lot of time teaching subjects we now have Netflix documentaries for, but they've spent very little time teaching us how to communicate with each other and critical thinking, which is something that almost no documentary that advocates for a cause encourages you to do. I did not take a class on critical thinking until college. Please do not make up your mind on what I am trying to say until the video is over, because I will not have made my point until the end. And these issues are so charged that no matter how clear I try to be, some people will still not hear what I am actually saying. In the book, Stamped from the Beginning by Dr. Ibram Kendi, he recounts how what started as mere ideas in people's heads became racist actions that went on to ravage through reality for generations. The book opens by talking about current racial inequities that are a result of racist ideas that predate America. Kendi asserts that the polarizing debate surrounding race can be categorized into three camps, segregationists, assimilationists, and anti-racists. Segregationists say that racial disparities are black people's fault. Assimilationists say that racial disparities are caused by both environment and minorities by nature. And anti-racists say that disparities are due to discrimination and no race is inferior to another. The book details how there are producers of racist ideas and consumers of racist ideas. People creating a narrative out of self-interest and people who are manipulated or unquestioning that believe the narrative because the people in power said so. Why question something that's benefiting you? When science presented contradictions to the beliefs of the time, people in power would constantly come up with new ways to propagate racism and slavery. They would skew the science to advance their political objectives and ignore evidence based off of self-interest. They would create racist policies and people would adhere to those policies and then want to defend themselves and their group and their policies. So the book asks the question, was slavery a matter of discrimination, disparities between races by nature, or both. After reading the book, I learned that the birth of racism is systematic. 
People want power, and from that breeds feelings of hatred. And those feelings of hatred create racist ideas and actions, and people become so familiar with these ideas and actions that they become common sense. Kendi says that he went into his research with the bias that there are no racist black people, only to realize that racism is not an identity. He defines racism as ideas that suggest that any racial group is inferior or superior in any way. And since they are ideas, anyone can possess them. Anti-racist ideas are ideas that support the notion that all racial groups are equal. Here is a brief history of ideas people use to create a reality in the name of narrow-minded self-interest. And I say a narrow-minded view of self-interest because we work better collectivistically, so it is more beneficial for us to work together. The first racist literature was produced because Prince Henry was jealous of the main Muslim trading depot. He saw that they had riches and slaves, and so he wanted to capture them. His nephew commissioned Gomez Yanez de Zurara to write a book to support the narrative that owning slaves was attractive and actually they were also doing missionary work by owning specifically African slaves. They claimed that it was a way to Christianize the savages. The book claimed that Africans needed slavery because they were animals that needed taming. So this was slavery disguised as a noble cause so that people could make money. There were also three long-running myths about Africans. Curse theory, which suggested that Noah told his sons not to have sex on the ark and his sexually promiscuous son Ham did not refrain and so his descendants were cursed with dark skin and looked on as symbols of trouble. Climate theory which suggested that black people would have lighter skin and hair if they went to colder climates and polygenesis which is a myth that different racial groups came from different Adam and Eves. Slavery eventually reached America and John Cotton and Richard Mather went to Boston to build churches for power and influence. They wanted to create a more pure version of Christianity. Then Harvard was founded, and since Cotton and Mather were followers of Aristotle, they made it so that Greek and Latin texts could not be disputed, and thus Aristotle, who was a smart person with bad ideas, could not be disputed. He had teachings on human hierarchy, and so the Puritans came to believe we were like a pyramid with Puritans at the top and African slaves at the bottom. Then there was tobacco. Planters wanted slaves for their profit, and missionaries wanted slaves to advance God's kingdom. Slave owners did not want their slaves to be baptized because they claimed that Africans were barbaric, they claimed that Africans were savages, and they claimed that Africans could not be loved even by God. And the missionaries and the slave owners fought over this without asking the slaves what they wanted. So the white man decided for the black man, and they published literature to propagate the idea that slaves wanted to be owned as a means to salvation. When white men wanted to cover their desire for African women because they weren't supposed to be tempted by who they claimed to be animals, this is so gross, they wrote literature to paint black women as sexually aggressive. Then there was John Locke who spread the idea that white people have the purest minds and Africans have dirty minds. Then there was Cotton Mather, a descendant of John Cotton and Richard Mather. He was a preacher who spread his forefathers' ideas but with new codes. He wrote a book about witchcraft which helped to launch the Salem witch trials, during which people described the devil as black and like a monkey, and so black people became further associated with criminality. Then people started to think maybe we shouldn't own people, but we shouldn't have interracial relationships, and we shouldn't allow black people in office, and they should still be classified as cattle. Even during the so-called Enlightenment era, people held the belief that black people had no self-determination and white people had the divine right to rule them. Then there was a conspiracy theory about vaccines. Africans wanted to kill their masters by convincing them to get vaccinated. Phyllis Wheatley was a poet who wanted to get published, but had to prove to white men that she was smart by their standards and then when she proved herself, they said it was because she was never really a slave because she was raised by the Wheatley family as a daughter since they had lost their daughter. She was eventually published in Britain a year after they abolished slavery, and her poetry and success were used to condemn slavery in America. American slave owners blamed Britain for giving slaves hope and courage to rebel. Then there was Thomas Jefferson, who was eventually told by the slaves that he grew up around about the horror that slavery really was. And he heard them and supposedly believed them. And he went on to help write the Declaration of Independence, stating all men are created equal, and said that he believed that slavery was against human nature while still owning slaves. 
So he was like, I own slaves, but it's cool. I have black friends. People started to realize that they couldn't justify having Africans as slaves. Jefferson later wrote that Africans only operated off of instinct and felt love more, but felt pain less. And since they could never assimilate that they should be sent back to Africa because people believed that only one race could win. Black people didn't want to go to Africa, a place that they had never been, they wanted to keep the benefits of their labor. Then there was the three-fifths compromise, counting slaves as kind of people instead of animals, which was used to get the South more legislation representation. From that, a persuasion was born, and white people said to black people, go ahead, prove yourself. Fit into the white mold to make things work. Then Uncle Tom's Cabin was published, written as anti-slavery media, but was later criticized because Uncle Tom was made to be the hero for being a good slave to God. Then there was the Civil War. War is born from ideas. Lincoln is shot three days after he says that black people should have the right to vote. Assassination is born from ideas. Then there was the rise of the KKK. Terrorism is born from unchecked ideas. Black people were blamed for fighting back. Oppression is born from ideas. Rape was used as an excuse to lynch black men. Injustice is born from ideas. Then there was the civil rights movement. Justice is born from ideas. Then there was Angela Davis who said that white people are not the standard. And there was media that continued to portray black people as the antagonist of the story. Then Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered for sharing an idea. And then people gave the I'm colorblind lip service because ignorance breeds from uncriticized ideas. Ultimately, Racism is an ad hominem strategy people use to get what they want. So when we're asking what happened in the case of Ahmaud Arbery, we should keep in mind that acting on ideas without evidence and ignoring evidence for the sake of self-interest is exactly how we got injustice in the first place. Putting away anyone accused of a crime without evidence does not undo the pain of a victim. And ignoring victims creates a world where narcissists have all the power. Polarization from politics has made it so that the most important topics are untouchable from every side. And there are cowardly tropes that say we should never talk religion and politics to make sure that we never learn how. I was thinking that I would love to give the proceeds from this video to the National Institute for Black Child Development, but this channel is new and has not yet met the requirements for monetization. However, I am on unemployment while furloughed from my job because of everything that's going on, so it's like I'm getting paid to do this. So I'm pledging $1 for every comment from a unique user because I want people to see this video up to $500. But in light of advocacy for critical thinking, if critiques come out for the book Stamp from the Beginning, or if people criticize this video, listen to those criticisms. Because opinions are asserted into both. And I hope the educators of this generation teach their students how to talk to each other in a way that we can't. Because I have a dream. <laughs> My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. Today.